if a week is an eternity in politics, just imagine how different the Canadian political scene might be towards the end of October. Barring what can't be foreseen, our next federal election will most likely be decided by voters who either want more of the same or feel that after more than nine years, it's time for the Conservatives to go. If it's the latter, the overriding question is, which of the two leaders from the province of Quebec will they entrust their votes to? Tom Mulcair or Justin Trudeau? To help us understand what's in play, what's at stake, we welcome, in our nation's capital, Brooke Jeffrey, political scientist at Concordia University in Montreal and author of the recently published Dismantling Canada, Stephen Harper's new conservative agenda. And Jeffrey Simpson, national affairs columnist at The Globe and Mail. And with us here in studio, Michael Dentant, national political columnist for Post Media News, and Jerry Nichols, communications consultant and well-known, shall I say conservative or libertarian commentator? Yeah, libertarian probably Libertarian you prefer. Okay. Good to welcome everybody to the program tonight. I want to start by just reminding everybody of the obvious. This race is really close. Latest public opinion polls, please. Conservatives at 30. New Democrats at 29. Liberals at 27. This thing is wide open. And we're already starting to see the advertising from all of the campaigns, but let's look in particular at what the two opposition parties have on offer as they look to replace the incumbent government. Let's roll it, please. This is the Rose family. Like most families, they help each other to make life work. Richard and Maria willingly sacrifice paying down debt to save for their kids' education. These are the kinds of choices more Canadian families have faced in 10 years under Stephen Harper. I won't accept it. Our plan will give middle-class families the Canada Child Benefit, $2,500 more per year, tax-free, than they get now. Fairness, it's an idea that works for the whole country. You work hard every day to give your family the best. Your government should be there to help your family make ends meet. Grow our economy while protecting our environment for generations to come. Get Canada on track. That means putting families and their priorities first. I was raised on middle class values and I'll work to strengthen the middle class. Together we can bring change in Ottawa. I invite you to be part of it. Jeffrey Simpson, get us started. Both those leaders voiced over their own ads. Those are those vo their, their voices that we're hearing in the background. Mm -hmm. They're both obviously trying to be the champion of the anti-conservative forces. Do you think these ads are meant to speak to the same voters? Well, they both talk about the middle class, middle class values, middle class families. And uh, so they are basically targeting the same group, although almost everybody in Canada thinks they're middle class. People who are demonstrably poor often think that they're actually aspiring to or are in the middle class. And people who by any standard are extremely affluent, they think they're in the middle class too. So it's a pretty elastic group they're appealing to. Brooke Jeffrey, both Mulcair and Trudeau are trying to portray themselves as the champion of the anti-Harper vote, but they both have very different things on offer. Let's look at Justin Trudeau first. He's got that charisma thing happening. How's that going so far? Well, obviously not as well as it did a few months ago. Uh, and the question is whether or not uh, it's um, an important change that's taken place or whether it's just a temporary phenomenon. Perhaps the Alberta election, perhaps some of the things that Mr. Harper has said recently. I think the main thing that Mr. Trudeau has going for him, in, in addition to the looks and the hair, is the fact that he is part of a liberal brand. And the Liberal Party is the one that people have traditionally looked to as the alternative of the progressive conservatives. But another thing he has going for him is the youth element. He's clearly a different generation than either Mr. Mulcair or Mr. Harper. And last but not least, I think he can attract, if he plays his cards right, uh, a large percentage of the ethnocultural vote and uh, the, not just the middle class, but the urban vote across the country. Let me read something that Scott Reed, who used to work as director of communications for Paul Martin when he was prime minister, here's what he wrote a couple of days ago in the Ottawa Citizen. He said, the worst part of the past few months for the Liberals hasn't been Bill C-51 or an NDP resurgence. It has been the weakened connection between the Liberal leader and voters. Change voters must hear a change mantra, and they must find it believable. What is Trudeau's sense of mission and purpose? What is he about? Why is he there? No pat answers about building a better future for his family and everyone's family. Give us something unsanded, something that sticks, something sharp. What gets his blood up? What would he fight for? The Liberals have just as good a chance to win the October election as the Conservatives or the NDP, 
probably even better. But the hard truth is that Trudeau is going to have to do it, and in order to do it, he's going to soon have to do a few things differently. Michael, you've, um, you've written that he's overscripted the Liberal leader. You've written that you wish he were allowed to be a little more like himself. Are you and Scott basically addressing the same problem? I think so, uh, you know, in, in slightly different ways. I think Trudeau had a, 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 a real kind of sense of momentum out the gate. There was the boxing match, and then quickly that followed on succession with the leadership race. He introduced this whole discussion of the middle class, which at the time was kind of interesting. It was borrowed from the Obama campaign but it, uh, of, of, uh, of 08, but it was interesting and new in Canada. He talked about that a lot. Uh, and, and then there was the Senate, right, that when he, when he sort of surprisingly booted all of the conservative or the liberal senators out of the, out of the liberal caucus. And all of that, I think, pr uh, presented an impression of him as somebody who was doing politics differently. Uh, and I think sometime around the, uh, the Liberal uh, co Policy Conference in uh, February of 2014 in Montreal, all of that changed because of a series of gaffes that he had made. And I think they decided to pull him back and make sure that that didn't happen because they wanted to keep their lead. Jerry, you remember with the Stefan Dion ads and the Michael Ignatieff ads, they were effective because they spoke to voters lingering unease about various aspects of those two former Liberal leaders. You've seen the ad that the Conservatives now have out against Justin Trudeau where, well, maybe someday, I'm not saying no forever, but not yet, he's not ready yet. Effective? Yeah, I think that's a legitimate message that the Conservatives are getting out, uh, out to voters. Uh, because Justin Trudeau is basically a one-trick pony. What's the trick? He's a celebrity. That's, that's his main selling feature. He's basically saying, vote for me because I'm famous. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a good political strategy. You think that's really all he's saying? That's all he's saying. And he can win with that, by the way. There's nothing wrong with that. You can win by being a celebrity because our society likes celebrities. However, the danger for him is that's all he's got. So if, you, if that starts to wear off, if the novelty starts to wear off, if the Tories can make his celebrity really work against him because they say, well, he's not ready to be, you know, he's, he's flashy, but there's no stake. He's not ready. And I think that's a message that will resonate with voters. He's got nothing to fall back on. He can't talk about economic policy with any credibility. He can't talk about foreign policy with any credibility. He has no experience. He's gaff prone, as Michael said. So all of these things combined, I think, spell trouble for the Liberals down the road. Jeffrey, do you agree that all he's got going for him is his celebrity status? Well, if he, if he doesn't talk a lot about policy, then I think he's probably going to be considered nothing more than a celebrity. So. Remember, there were many, many months when, yes, Mr. Trudeau did what Michael said on this or that, but there was no coherent policy. The Liberals kept saying they were going to save that until later. And when they did put out a policy, a, the one he talks about in his uh, television ad, uh, dealing with the anxieties of the middle class and middle class family worries about bringing up their children, he's really playing in the conservative sandbox. I mean, you can like the Conservatives or you can dislike them, but their messaging since they got into office is, we are interested in middle-class Canadians who we think are overtaxed in these difficult and parlous times. And as a consequence, we're going to cut the GST and cut a number of other taxes. If you look at the householders that Conservative MPs are now sending out to their constituents, they talk about nothing but the tax cuts that they've introduced since they came into office. So this is the issue of how to deal with middle class concerns that the Conservatives have been defining for nine years. Now along comes the Liberal Party saying, trust us, we're going to do more. And, and I'm, I, I say to myself, if I was an ordinary voter, and I'm not passing judgment on the wisdom of the policies, I'm simply saying if I was an ordinary voter and I had one party that had been cutting my taxes for a period of time, and the other one that was promising to do it if they got elected, I'd probably vote more be inclined to vote for the bird in hand than the bird that's flying around. <laughs> so that's the decision strategically that the Liberals have made. I think it's a very questionable strategy to out-conservative the Conservatives. Brooke, let me just follow up with you, though, on this issue of celebrity. Some people, Jerry's one of them, I guess, says that's all that Justin Trudeau's got going for him. Others would say that's not as much celebrity as it is a real connection with everyday people. Which do you see it as? Well, I think that's true that I mean, obviously he has a famous name, but I think on his own merits he made a connection with young Canadians which saw 
uh, an increase in membership in the Liberal Party, for example, and brought new people into the policy mix. If you look at some of his candidates, you know, they're pretty impressive people that he's recruited to run in the election with him. And I think one of the things that he needs to do to make it clear that, that the Liberal Party is capable of governing again is to talk about the team, and I'm sure he will do that. And he's recruited people in both economics and even things like defense and foreign policy to show that the Liberal Party has that range. But I think the other thing, just following up on what Jeffrey said, is that you know, it, it would be a mistake to try and out Tory the Tories because it's exactly as you said at the beginning. 65% of Canadians don't want to vote for this government. And so the issue really is are they going to pick the NDP or the Liberals? And the Liberals have to demonstrate that they are more capable and ready to, to govern than the NDP. But they also have to show that they, they have to remind people, I think, about liberal values and the things that are behind some of the programs and why they're doing them. And they haven't done much of that yet, and I'm hoping that they will soon. Well, the speech that he gave in Toronto was a good example of that. There's another organization that is weighing into this mix as well, and they're not a political party. They're a new group called Working Canadians. And they're not all that <laughs> thrilled with what's happening, uh, either from the NDP or the Liberals. Uh, let's play this ad of theirs, and then we'll come back and chat. Roll the clip, please. Justin Trudeau has been very lucky, a famous name, wealth, but can he relate to us? Trudeau consistently votes against tax cuts for seniors and families. He said no to the home renovation tax credit, no to the children's fitness tax credit, and no to a tax credit to take care of sick and aging relatives. Can someone who's never had to worry about money or their job possibly understand those who do? Trudeau, he doesn't understand middle class families and he never will. A message from working Canadians. That's a pretty tough tagline, Michael. You know, can someone who's never had to worry about making any money worry about you who has to make money? Uh, do you think it's a good political strategy to remind Canadians that this guy grew up under highly unusual circumstances? Absolutely it is. A absolutely. It's, it's an effective strategy, and they've been, the Conservatives have been very uh, consistent in, in pursuing that line for a long time. And I think that consistency is part of the reason why Trudeau's facing some some trouble in the polls right now because there's a cumulative effect with the messaging and, it, and that's how it's designed. That, that being said, I think it's, it, it, it's really a talking point and unfair and not true to say that Trudeau is nothing but a celebrity. If you look at the, the organizational acumen he's brought and the people around him have brought to the Liberal Party, particularly in terms of, of changing the fundraising model completely to a to, to uh, conform to the new world of, of multiple small donations, mm -hmm. they've done a pretty good job. And, and if you look at Trudeau's background, uh, he really is a ground game politician. That's how, really how he won the, uh, the, his initial battles in Papineau, both the nomination battles and the elections. Uh, and I think that's the sensibility he's trying to bring to the party. His problem, uh, quite frankly, is that when push comes to shove, all of that is eclipsed by a person's gravitas in debate. There are going to be a lot of debates. They're going to be very, very important this time, maybe more important than ever. And I think the questions being raised are legitimate, which is just, can he hold his own in debate with Thomas Mulcair and Stephen Harper? And I don't you, think we know the answer. How would you answer the question? Jerry. Well, uh, I think Justin Trudeau's problem, again, is that uh, people are asking him to do things which are beyond his skill set. Well, he's, he's a performer, so if you're performer. asking him to be impressive in a debate... Well, it, I think it depends what kind of debate. If you're just asking him to stand behind a podium and answer, can, answer you know, canned answers to predictable questions, how much do you love Canada, Mr. Trudeau? You know, he'll, he'll, he'll give good answers. He's very good at sort of uttering out the platitudes. But if you get him in a debate where he has to answer anything that's complex or, 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 or a little complicated, then he struggles. And we've seen him struggle when asked with questions about ISIS or economic policy or things like that. And this is, this is the basic problem the Liberals have in asking him to talk about economic policy. He just can't do it. Well, He's just not equipped to do it. Uh, he struggles with those kinds of questions. And so that's what I say. Asking him to talk about economic policies is asking him to do something that he can't do. The only thing he can do is smile for photo ops and look charming and look nice. And can he win that way? Yeah. I think the challenge for the Liberal Party is they've got to rekindle that sort of sense of Trudeau mania that Michael was talking about when he first came in. Jeffrey, I hear you're trying to get in. Oh, if I was a liberal, I would love what Jerry just said. Uh, <laughs> the more you talk Trudeau down, the more you lower the expectations of how he's got to perform in order to surprise people. 
So bring on all that stuff that we just heard from Jerry. And then all he has to do is stand up on his feet and talk marginally coherently. And people will say, oh my god, he's better than we thought he was. So um, I think low expectations will help. Now, they've been rehearsing him, according to an article in the Hill Times, for about six months for these debates. I have to say I was a bit perplexed by his in and out as to whether there should be a debate with these people and under this format. If I had been advising him, I would have said, I'm going to debate Mr. Harper wherever there's a debate. I'll, I'll do it in the... In, in the bathroom, I'll do it in the front room, I'll do it in the, wherever he wants, I'm ready. Uh, rather than, and similarly, Canadians are ready for accommodation between the Liberals and the NDP. Don't rule out a coalition, that's premature. Let me say something else that's going to happen now. You mentioned the poll at the beginning with the NDP leading. There will be other polls that have the NDP at or near the top. That changes the expectations for the NDP. People will now be scrutinizing more carefully what they are promising. Does the NDP platform, such as we know it, hang together? Is Mr. Mulcair angry Tom, or is he somebody in that television commercial? You can bet that the Conservatives and Liberals, in due course, will begin to focus their criticisms on the NDP to take account of the reality they didn't expect. So the dynamics of the discussion among the three parties, which had hitherto been the two bigger parties will ignore the NDP, that will change fairly soon. Jeffrey, you've handed me a lovely segue to take us from the Liberals to a closer look at the NDP. And in fact, it's been 28 years since the New Democrats pulled this competitively. You've got to go back to May of 1987, when New Democrats had 37 percent, Liberals at 36, Tories at 25. I hasten to add that 18 months later, the conservative government of Brian Mulroney was re-elected. So polls this far in advance of a federal election are no harbinger of what is to come. They are a splendid reflection of what happened the day before. So with all of that in place, let's get into this about the NDP. Brooke, based on what you've seen so far, do the Thomas Mulcair New Democrats look like they are ready to govern? Well. I think there are a number of problems for them. One is going to be these expectations. Another is that they haven't actually articulated a coherent platform. Some of their positions on issues, they'll have trouble. Mr. Harper will be sure to remind everybody of some of the things they've said in the past. Uh, and on economic issues, industry and, and energy policy, they'll have some trouble there. Canadians may feel they're too extreme once they start to look at them. Then there's the angry Tom issue. I'm not sure they're going to think that Mr. Mulcair is a, a warm and fuzzy middle class person any more than Mr. Trudeau is. Mr. Trudeau can at least say, well, neither was my father or Lester Pearson or a number of the best uh, prime ministers we ever had, a member of the middle class. And what's that got to do with anything? So I think Mr. Mulcair as a person has a problem relating to Canadians. They don't know him very well and they don't necessarily have a positive image. But I think he's got no real team behind him either. He's got a lot of MPs who have virtually no experience except for the time that they've spent in the back benches now. And he'd have trouble putting together a team that looks like it's a cabinet in waiting. Michael, look at the monitor over my shoulder here because this issue of angry Tom seems to come up a lot. And here's a cartoon that was in uh, Jeffrey Simpson's newspaper not too long ago. Thomas Mulcair, there's the bus, there's his picture. He's not angry anymore. More warmth, more cuddliness. That's what the um, bubble says above the guys who are painting the side of the bus. Uh, here's my question. Michael, Stephen Harper's not a cuddly guy. It's worked pretty well for him. Why are we sort of, and I, I guess I say we because I hear so many people in mainstream media saying this, why are we saying Tom Mulcair's got to be cuddlier when clearly Stephen Harper's been plenty politically successful without being warm and cuddly? Well, I think the obvious answer is because Mulcair until now has not just been playing, uh, trying to, to present a contrast with Harper. He's trying to present a contrast with Trudeau. And Trudeau, you know, until very recently was the guy that was likable. And now uh, things have changed, but that's fairly new still. So a lot of the, the NDP's efforts uh, through last year and into this year have been designed, I think, to make Mulcair appear more approachable, more gregarious, kinder, all of these things. And I think they've been pretty successful in that. I mean, if you've noticed uh, all of his recent speeches, 
he'll be you know halfway through a speech and and then he'll stop there'll be a pause for applause and then this flashing a brilliant smile will beam out <laughs> and you know oh Mulcair is happy he's a happy guy so they've done that and they've been very uh, good at it I think uh, in fairness the problem that they're going to have I suspect when when people start asking questions about the platform is simply well three things uh, the Sherbrooke declaration 50 percent plus one to trigger negotiations to, towards the breakup of the country they've never really addressed that they just stopped talking about it Dutch disease which Mulcair talked a lot about uh, not that long ago uh, the, the notion that the, that a weak you know Canadian dollar uh, or sorry that a strong Canadian dollar propped up by resource uh, revenue was was crushing manufacturing in the east that's problematic for them because the price of oil has collapsed and yet manufacturing is still weak in the east so there's a contradiction there and the biggest problem uh, I see for them is the Senate their, their notions of Senate reform that you can simply roll up the red carpet and, and abolish it have been completely blown out of the water by the Supreme Court so uh, the Supreme Court insists that ins has, has ruled in fact that you have to have a constitutional conference to abolish the Senate so how is he going to do that when is he going to do it is that a first term project is it something that will happen later we still don't know as a bumper sticker though heading into an election a triple-a Senate <laughs> abolished 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 it's it's terrific yeah. and it's populist and I, I think it'll play well until somebody asks the question in a debate how are you going to do it Jerry do you think Tom Mulcair needs to be warmer and cuddlier to be a recipient of more people's votes well, he should shave first of all seriously yeah. I hear this all the time you yeah. really think yeah. he needs to shave yeah I think he should shave yeah Absolutely. five months before an election he well, should change his look he, he probably should have shaved before but I think it's going to be a problem for him uh, but I think the real problem for the NDP is, is not that he's not cuddly. I mean, in politics, you don't have to get people to like you. You just have to get them to agree with you. And that's essentially what Stephen Harper did. He, remember, he tried the, the cuddly bit with the sweater and sitting by the fire. It didn't work because it wasn't real. Uh, Thomas Mulcair has to be who he is. And if he's a tough guy, fine, he's a tough guy. He can use that to say, look, I'm the only guy that can beat Stephen Harper. Pitting Justin Trudeau against uh, Harper is like pitting a, a goldfish against a barracuda. I'm the only guy that can beat him, and I think that's a message that will resonate with a lot of progressive voters who want to get rid of Harper. That's basically, they want to get rid of Harper, and they're wondering who can do the best job of that. Now, the danger that, that Mulcair faces is his brand. The NDP brand, I think, might make a lot of voters out there still a little bit skittish. NDP brand in Alberta is looking pretty good these days. Yeah, and that's, that's what you can use to sort of you know, grab onto and say, look, if, if Albertans voted, it can't be that bad. But there still might be some residual fear out there. And I think what Harper's going to do, and you know, when he went after Trudeau, he said, this guy's a clown. You know, I wouldn't trust this kid to run a lemonade stand, let alone the, the national economy. That's the attack he's using against Trudeau. Against Mulcair, that won't work. He's got to say, this guy's scary. He's going to have some radical left-wing policies, a hidden left-wing agenda. That's what they're going to use against Mulcair. Jeffrey Simpson, I think of you've course. watched uh, <laughs> opposition. That's what the liberals... Go ahead. <laughs> that's what the liberals used against Harper. They had a hidden agenda, remember? <laughs> Harper got elected. I was going to say, follow up on that if you would, Jeffrey. I, th I think you've watched opposition parties, official oppositions anyway, in, in Ottawa for three and a half decades. How, how fit do these guys look in terms of their readiness to win an election, to govern, to put up a cabinet that you know, looks representative of the country? What's your view on that? Well, if you look at the Alberta election, there were very few people apart from, if any, apart from Rachel Notley, whom Albertans knew and as a consequence had any confidence in. And when they decided that the time was up for the right of center forces who were split to be in office, nothing could save the right of center forces. Hmm. So in at the moment, the NDP is the dominant party in the province of Quebec federally. It's got, according to the polls, about a third of the support in Alberta. And it could grow if the Notley government performs competently in the first four or five months. It's got a solid base of support in British Columbia. It's got some support scattered throughout Ontario. It's got some support in the Maritime and Atlantic provinces. It's got some, it will win some seats in Saskatchewan because of redistribution that groups together some urban areas instead of splitting them urban-rural. It's got some support in Winnipeg. So it's a genuinely national party now. And I go back to Jerry's point. There's 60 percent, Brooks said 65, let's not argue, 60 to 65 percent of Canadians who will not under any circumstances vote conservative. 
And in fact, the longer the Conservatives have been in office, which is a normal pattern, by the way, the more determined their opponents are to get rid of them, because they've seen them for four more years. So that 60 percent has a lot of what one of my polling friends calls promiscuous progressives. <laughs> that is to say, they're going to search around. They're going to look at who's the best alternative to get rid of the Harper government. People generally aren't going to vote on platforms about the Senate or about uh, this or that. Exactly. They're going to vote on whose values are closest to mine and how can we get rid of the government in office. And at the moment, I have to say, as I travel around the country, my ear a little bit now to the ground, I'm hearing an awful lot of people asking me, does that guy Trudeau have it? Hmm. They're not asking that about Mulcair. They're asking it about Trudeau. The Liberals were the natural fallback position for most of the anti-conservative anti crowd for a long time. They are not anymore. In our remaining few minutes here, let me put one more issue on the table, and it may well be the most controversial decision Justin Trudeau made in the lead-up to this fall election, and that is his decision not, not to oppose C-51, the anti-terrorism anti bill. Uh, he said, we're getting close to an election. I don't want the Conservatives to be able to demonize me on this, and therefore, we'll go along to get along for now. If we win, we'll change it. Um, Michael, I want your view on the advisability of that decision. It was a mistake. It was a mistake. I mean, it, it, the rationale was, we know it's going to pass anyway. Why should we vote against it and allow them to, to club us over the head with the accusation that we're soft on terror and, you know, conventional hug-a-thug uh, liberals, right? That, that's what they were trying to avoid. And tactically, it made sense. Uh, but, uh, you know, over time, it's clearly emerged that the, 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 the cleverness of it, the too cuteness of it, I think really hurt them in the sense that it made them look like and made him look like he, he was trying to uh, be too clever by half and not apply principle, which Mulcair really took advantage of. Tom Mulcair came out clearly in opposition to it. And in fact, a new Democrat, Brooke, tweeted the following. Uh, this new Democrat said, Senior Trudeau brought Charter of Rights and Junior is helping Harper to destroy it. You think that carries some weight? Well, I think it was a mistake not to have opposed it. I have to say that. Um, and, you know, he gave the speech in Toronto and that was obviously supposed to be the, the, uh, a, the way to get around that. But I think politically it was a mistake. I certainly don't think it was fatal. But it's clear, you know, Mr. Mulcair opposed it. It didn't cost him votes in Quebec. And I think th this has got to do with the scripting issue. It would have been Trudeau's personal preference to oppose it. So they should have done so, and I can't deny that. On the other hand, I think just to get back to what Jeffrey said, the, they are still asking in the country the question, is Trudeau up to it? They're not asking if Mulcair is up to it. And that's because the Liberals remain the first fallback choice. People instinctively aren't going to vote NDP if they think they can trust the Liberals. And at the end of the day, with 65% of the country determined not to vote for the Conservatives, He's right. Platform doesn't matter. And I'm pretty sure that a lot of other things about the cabinet and the, and the position on the Senate don't matter. It's who you trust. And I think the Liberals and the Liberal brand and Justin Trudeau still have a good chance of becoming the party that people trust. Well, Brooke, it's possible they're not asking it about Tom Melcare because they know he's up to it. He's been a provincial cabinet minister. He looks like he has gravitas. He a doesn't have to pass don't that even test. A lot of people don't even know who Tom Mulcair is. You know, there are a lot of other polls which suggest that he's very, he's a real unknown to many Canadians still, which is why he's trying so hard to become better known and, and using this huge communication splits. Jeffrey, how and do you think that, work. how do you think, Jeffrey, the decision on C-51 plays out in the mix? I don't think people, I, I, wish, I wish people followed public issues as closely as um, others uh, do, but... Um, I don't think at the end of the day it's a crippler. I, I think what it did among people who followed it in general was to suggest that Mr. Trudeau was doing this for tactical reasons. I mean, Brooks said he didn't really believe it. I don't know that. But if he didn't really believe it, why did he do what he did? So he, he tries, if, if you do that and you're a new face in the, in the political world and you're trying to seem fresh, and not cynical like the old gang, but then you actually do something that's cynical, it doesn't help you. Hmm. Um, I think there's three, very briefly, storylines, and we haven't talked about the Conservatives. 
But with all the huge advantages that conservatives have had for the last six months, and boy, they've lined their ducks up very well, they haven't gone anywhere in public opinion. The liberals, on the other hand, have been in serial decline for a year. This is not something in the last couple of months. And the NDP has been in serial rise to the point where they are now leading or will be leading in some polls, which, as I said before, changes the dynamic quite a lot in Canadian politics. And we shall see whether Mr. Mulcair can reassure Canadians against the scare campaign that will be launched by the Conservatives and the Liberals, by the way, against the NDP's past and against its possible present. And we won't know that until the, camp, until the attacks begin and he responds. A dramatic and unfolding story which will continue to follow towards Election Day, which is the 19th of October. Thanks, everybody, for weighing in tonight here on TVO. Jeffrey Simpson from The Globe and Mail, Brooke Jeffrey from Concordia University, Michael Dentant from Post Media, Jerry Nichols, the communications consultant. Appreciate having you all on TVO tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.